pani filmu na to, co się dzieje. Lajka szukana. Też to. Też stranne. I want to share uh, a story today about how our thinking at CLIA has changed over the two years, the last two years, about how we deliver changes and value to our customers. And uh, there's bits and pieces that I want to share how the DevOps movement has helped us along the way. And, and my story starts with Alice. So what, what do I want you to take away from my talk today? Uh, I want you to forget the false dichotomy. You don't have to, you know, focus either on quality or productivity, either on stability or speed. You can have both. You just need to change the way you think about these things and change the way you change these things. And the way you change these things is by focusing on uh, experimenting with process, not by telling people to be more careful or working faster, you know. And that's it. That's all for me. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Indrak, um, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, distributed tracing. Uh, I work at CLIA as a software architect, uh, where I was also heavily involved in introducing distributed tracing to the CLIA system. So uh, I will try to share some of my experience with this. So today I want to talk about uh, three topics. The first is um, I want to talk about logging and metrics and why logging and metrics is not always enough. After that I will show how tracing can solve these problems. And lastly, I will uh, talk about how can you introduce a distributed tracing to your system and what are the common problems. So uh, let's get started. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about logging and metrics. At CLIA, we heavily use metrics. Uh, we use metrics to re record information like uh, resource usage, connection counts, error rates, online user counts, and so on. We also create alarms and monitors based on those metrics. And we also create dashboards for the services based on those metrics so we know if a service is healthy or not. Uh, for logs, we use Elasticsearch and Kibana. And logs are mostly used for uh, uh, triaging problems. So if we find out that there's uh, some kind of problem, we open the logs and see if we can solve it. But the thing with the metrics and logging is that metrics and logging tell a story uh, from the perspective of one application. So this is completely fine when you have only one application. But if you have uh, like microservices-based uh, architecture where you have multiple applications, uh, then this can get more complex. And uh, I'm going to go over a few examples uh, to show uh, when this can be a problem. And this is the first example. Uh, let's say uh, you're browsing your site, you fill in a form, you click submit, and you get an error. So what I would usually do is I open the browser console immediately, see the, what happened with the request. Let's say there was a 500 internal server error. Now with uh, monolith application, we could usually solve it just by opening the logs, finding the request, maybe we see the exception, the stack trace, the stack trace will include the call stack, uh, where the error came from, we fix it, that's it. Now with the distributed systems, however, this gets more complicated. Sometimes we're able to solve the problem the same way, but uh, often the problem might not be the service that we made request to, it might be a dependency of that service. So the error might happen somewhere in the downstream. We might not even get the 500 error, maybe it's like 500 free service unavailable or something. Now, we can use logs to de debug this. We open the first service logs, the service A logs in this case, find the request, maybe we see that uh, 
all right, this service made an outbound request to the service B, and there was an error there, so we opened the service B logs. We uh, tried to correlate the logs using the timestamps. Maybe we find the request, but maybe that one redirects us to the next service, and maybe there's like 10 of them in a row. So it's a very tedious process. And even if we find that there was an error in service D, we can't really be sure if that was because of our request or was that some other request that uh, was sent to the service D. So this is the problem number one. Why did the request fail? Let's look at the second problem. It's kind of similar. You were filling a form, you press submit, and it was just slow. And you don't know why. It should have been instant. So you check the logs, you see that the service A processed the request in 750 milliseconds. Well, not terribly bad, but it should be faster. Again, we don't know really why the request was slow. Maybe, maybe the service A was processing something, but maybe it was blocked by some downstream service. We could start again, start looking into the logs and metrics, maybe find something. Maybe the metrics say that, hey, service D was acting slowly at that time, but we still don't have any idea if it affected our request or not. So this is uh, problem number two. Why, why was the request slow? And uh, third and final problem. Let's say we have an endpoint, like a really important endpoint. This is an endpoint that uh, users use to send us money, and we like money. So we need to make sure that this endpoint is always available and working. But uh, to ensure this, we, we need to know, we need to ensure also that its dependencies are available and working. So we need to know what are uh, these uh, endpoint services. So. We basically want a dependency graph. One way to do this is again go to the logs, maybe we can figure out all the outgoing requests, but that seems kind of impossible. The other way is we actually read the code, read the service A code, check the endpoint, go to the next service, read the code, and so on and so on. But that's also very tedious. Uh, if, uh, if you're using like service mesh uh, software, then maybe you're able to generate a general service dependency graph, uh, which is not scoped to one request. Uh, that's also sometimes useful, uh, but I find the request scope dependency graph more useful. So this is the problem number three. Um, <coughs> which services were involved um, completing a request? So we have three problems now. Why did the request fail? Why was the request slow? And what services were involved completing the request? These are pretty simple questions that we should be able to answer relatively quickly. But usually when using microservices, we really aren't. So let's try to solve these problems ourselves. Let's not use any existing tools, and let's figure something out. And let's start from the last problem. We want to know which services were involved completing a request. One idea how to do this is that uh, we need something to trace the request throughout the system. And uh, if we have some shared information, we could log it out, correlate the logs, and get the all involved services. So let's try this. Let's generate a random ID in the first service, let's call it trace ID, and whenever there's an outbound request, let's propagate it using HTTP headers, for example. And when the second service gets the request, it just uses the same thing and propagates it as well. And each time a re request is processed, each service logs some log message, like processed request, with the service name and, tra and trace ID. So now with this, we can just uh, find all the uh, related logs using the trace ID. And we can generate kind of dependency graph. Now, we know now which services were involved. We don't really know how they were involved, like uh, both the service C uh, and service F 
uh, talking with each other or were there some other links between the, those. So we can do better. Let's, uh, let's introduce a new concept called span. Let's generate, let's do that. Uh, each service generates a span ID. Like we did with trace ID, we'll leave that, propagate that. But now also each service generates a second ID, which is span ID, and propagates this to the other services. Uh, but when a service receives the span ID, then it stores it as a parent ID and uh, generates a new span ID. Now each service can log the same message as previously with the service trace ID, but now we can also add parent ID and span ID. And span is kind of like a, a, a small span of a trace. So, with this information, we can uh, use trace ID to get all the relevant logs or spans. And uh, with the parent ID and span ID, we can also see the relationships between those. So we can generate something like this. This solves our first problem. Our first problem, I start from the last one. <laughs> um, <coughs> let's look how can we solve the second problem, the slow request. Turns out that we don't need to change much. We can use our existing implementation. We still propagate the trace IDs, span IDs, but uh, now we just add some metadata to our span. So let's add the duration, request duration, and request uh, start timestamp. We don't need to <coughs> propagate this information. We can just record it in the service and then uh, log it out. Now, with this information, we can actually generate uh, what is called a time sequence diagram. Looks kind of like this. You read it from uh, top to bottom. Each of the lines is a span. So the left side kind of looks like a dependency graph. And on the right side, each of the bars, uh, each of the bar widths indicates the span duration. And the start location, like the margin from the left, indicates uh, when the processing started. So with this uh, diagram, we can easily see that uh, service A was waiting for service B, and service B was waiting for service D, and all the other requests were pretty quick. So we can immediately see that, all right, maybe we should look into the service D. But we can actually improve this. We can add some extra metadata here uh, to to help us figure out what exactly is the problem in, in this request. So let's change a few things. Let's change the processed request span. Uh, let's rename it to incoming HTTP request. Let's add a new span outgoing HTTP request. And also, whenever there's a database query, then let's add a span for that as well. So the trace ID span ID propagation logic is all the same. It's just more granular. With this information, we can again generate a time sequence diagram. Now we can see incoming, outgoing requests. Maybe we can see if there's a network issue. Uh, I currently collapsed the uh, span, spans for the service P. If I open this, then I see that, OK, that's kind of odd. There's like a ton of database queries happening. And I don't know if you can see, but the database queries themselves are pretty short, like 20 milliseconds, not terribly bad. So alarms and monitors don't trigger because of that, uh, but there's just many of them, and that creates a delay. Um, yeah, with, with this diagram, it's really easy to see, like, all right, may, maybe this is an n plus one query problem, or maybe there's a weird while loop. We know exactly what to look for now. And uh, <coughs> uh, we can even add more metadata here. Maybe we should include the SQL query that's being executed and uh, can do different things. But anyway, this solves our second problem. And let, now let's look at our last or the first problem. So uh, we wanted to know why the request failed. And solving this is actually very easy. So 
we make a very minor change to our existing system that we just built. Let's do that every time the HTTP response code is 500 over that. Let's add a tag error equals true. That's it. Now we can again generate a time sequence diagram and have a little red indicator in each of the spans to indicate that there was an error. And here we can immediately see that the service D, the most downstream service, had an error. So maybe let's look what happened there. And we can also include, again, more metadata. So if there was an exception, maybe let's include the exception message and stack trace, which I actually also did. So we can immediately see like, what happened and what to fix. So this solves our last problem. And what I actually just showed you, or what we just built, here is actually how most existing distributed tracing systems currently work. Of course, you don't manually propagate uh, IDs and carry them and generate them. There's libraries that do it for, it for you, but the uh, core concept is basically the same. Mm. <coughs> Here's a span from a real distributed system uh, called Jaeger. So if we compare that span to our span that we built using the logging system, then it's very similar. There's the operation name, like we had database query. There's trace ID, span ID, parent span ID. We didn't use flags, which is usually used to indicate if a span should be exported and stored or not. And it's also propagated throughout the system. We use start time, duration, we use tags to indicate if there's an error, and some, most, uh, some systems also allow using logs uh, to add some extra information, like when the error exactly happened and some other information. In our custom system, we used logs to basically create this system, but in real life you usually have a separate distributed system system, distributed tracing system uh, and it, there's collectors you can set and uh, services and uh, spans directly to the collectors. Mm. I also want to show you a real trace from a CLIA system. So this is using the Zipkin tracing system. Uh, I won't go into the trace itself, I just wanted to show that it's kind of similar, like uh, we used in the examples. In the examples, I generated the graphs using the Jaeger tracing system, actually. But what I want to note here is that in real systems, the traces can get really long. So if there's some weird request happening, like in this case, it, this request involved uh, 13 services and was over 130 spans long. And just debugging this using uh, logs is uh, yeah, impossible. <laughs> uh, all right, then we got here. So let's say you now want to add tracing to your system as well. What do you do first? Well, first, I would recommend you to pick an existing tracing system. Don't invent it yourself. There's many out there. There's more than on this slide. Some are open source, some you can pay for. Uh, I don't really have any recommendations which one to choose. Like Test it out, see what fits most, which has your programming language support and so on. My only recommendation is uh, if you can, pick an open tracing compatible tracer. So uh, Open Tracing provides vendor neutral uh, tracing client APIs and instrumentation APIs. So if you instrument your service and in the future you decide, hey, I don't really like to use Zipkin, I want to use Jaeger, then you only have to change the client libraries and don't have to re-instrument your uh, service. Um, <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about how to instrument your service. Here's a Ruby example, but it doesn't really matter which language it is. Most are kind of similar. 
So in this case, the first part is I just uh, initialize the tracing library uh, in the sec uh, and set it up as the open tracing global tracer. Uh, the second part, I import an active record instrumentation library. This adds tracing support to the database queries. And the last part, track tracer adds uh, tracing support to the incoming HTTP requests. So I don't really have to do much here. And um, how this works usually is that the tracing information is uh, held in the thread local variable. Uh, so you don't have to manually propagate it. Although if you spawn threads or background jobs within the request, then you still have to propagate this information. But also uh, Open Tracing provides some simple APIs to do it, a couple of functions, and that's it. <coughs> and let's say you want to switch the tracing library, then you only change the first part where you initialize the tracer, and that's it. You, you don't have to worry about the other parts. That's one way how to add tracing here to your service. The second way is using uh, agents. So this is a Java feature. In this case, uh, instead of changing your application code, you pretty much just download a char file, set up some configuration, and when you start your Java uh, service, you, you specify the Java agent and configuration, and it will change your instrument, your service itself. So you don't have to change your uh, application code. Um, third way, which is kind of gives partial tracing support, is maybe you're already using uh, service mesh or sidecars like that's running that has Envoy proxies running with your services. So Envoy proxy also knows how to start and continue incoming and outgoing. Uh, uh, traces for a request. But the problem with Envoy Proxy is that it doesn't really know how to link the incoming and outgoing requests together. So you still have to propagate some information through, through your service to get uh, complete traces. And, and if you're already changing your service, then you might as just well use the framework libraries and you get like database tracing and all that as well. It doesn't really mean that uh, Envoy Proxy is always a bad choice. So if you have some service that's not used very much, or you really just can't change it, then uh, having partial traces is probably still better than nothing. All right, let's say you have infrastructure set up. You know how to add instrumentation to your service, but you have like, 200 services, and you can't really just add instrumentation to everywhere at once. Um, so you kind of have to prioritize what services to add uh, instrumentation first to get most benefit. Uh, my recommendation is to add uh, tracing first uh, to services that are serving uh, critical or interesting requests. So, for example, if you have a payment system, then maybe that's uh, more important for an online store than like comment management section. Um, after that, I think just take easy and quick targets. If half of your services are written in Java and you can use the agent, then why not just use that and you have coverage for half of your services. After that is pretty much everything else. Um, with one exception that may be standalone and uh, not often used services, uh, you can just skip them or maybe add, use the Envoy proxy to add some tracing to it. Right, and the last topic I want to talk about is sampling. So you set up your infrastructure, you instrument at your services, you start getting the traces, you soon notice that uh, tracing can generate a lot of data. One way to keep data low is to just not trace everything. Having uh, all the traces can... Uh, uh, having a lot of tracing volume can uh, 
increase your expenses, so the storage cost can go up, and also the data transmission uh, costs can go up. So to solve this, we can use sampling. Sampling is a process by which a decision is made whether to trace, is, uh, whether to export and save a span or not. Um, I'll go over a few sampling strategies. So the first one is constant. It's basically an on-off switch. So trace everything or trace nothing. If you have a site with low traffic or you don't care about money, then just trace everything. It gives you the most insight to your system. Uh, a second option is to use uh, something like probabilistic sampler. This is a sampler where you define a percentage value of how many uh, traces you want to keep. So let's say you set it to 1%, then only one trace out of 100 uh, it will be exported and stored. This, however, has a problem that if you have one endpoint that has a lot of traffic, like a millions of requests, second endpoint is maybe called twice a day, then you might not get a single trace for the second endpoint. Then there's the rate limiting sampler, which is very similar. But instead of defining a percentage, you define like, uh, I want to keep five seconds I, I want to store five traces per second. Uh, this also has the same problem as with probabilistic sampler, that uh, if you have an endpoint that's not called very often, you don't get any traces. Uh, <coughs> these three samplers are the most common samplers, like pretty much every distributed tracing system uh, implements those. Um, I also want to talk about the fourth one, which is uh, I found from the Jaeger tracing system, which I find interesting. Uh, the adaptive sampler ensures that you get at least some traces for each endpoint. So uh, it, it underneath it, it still uses the rate limiting sampler, but uh, it uses, uses it as uh, per operation basis. So for every endpoint or operation, it basically creates a separate rate limiting sampler. So you can say like I want one trace per second for each operation. These are all what is called head-based samplers. So the sampling decision is made uh, in the beginning of the trace. Uh, so there's uh, one problem with that. So for example, if you get an error in the middle of the trace, or the trace, uh, or the request duration is very long, or there's some other interesting attributes, then you can't really change the sampling decision in the middle of the trace. Um, so the decision is made in the beginning, then this uh, decision is propagated to the other services as well. And uh, you might lose some traces which contain errors, for example, which are the most interesting ones. The tail-based strategies or samplers try to solve this, uh, but they haven't really found any tracing systems to actually implement those. Uh, some are experimenting with those, but I think the main reason here is that uh, to make a decision afterwards, you have to first uh, export the traces to some centralized uh, place and then make a decision, but that then again, can increase the data transmission costs. So you're going to have to find a balance between your expenses and observability. At CLIA, we actually use the mix of tracers. So for example, in the testing environment and staging environment, we don't have much traffic. So we just trace everything, save everything. In the production environment, we only save 1% of, uh, of the traces. And also, other good way to keep uh, the expenses low is to have a low retention period of the traces. Maybe you don't have to keep them for a month, maybe you can just keep them for one week and that's enough for you. All right, and is it all worth it? So we went over three problems. One was, uh, why, why was there an error in a request? Uh, why was the request slow? 
and uh, which services were involved uh, completing a request? These are simple questions, and I think we should have relatively quick answers for them. And distributed tracing uh, helps us to provide these answers. Even though distributed tracing is a kind of new technology, or at least the software out there is, and uh, things are still changing. I think if you're using microservices-based architecture, then this can be very useful. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, the example that you showed, the, the GLIA one, it had more than 100 spans, and yes. the web interface seemed quite difficult to you know, navigate and analyze it. What kind of other methods or tools, maybe something programmatic, or to, to analyze and work with these long traces? Um. <coughs> Well, I, I guess it was a little bit hard because all the services were expanded. So expanded, so you uh, you saw all the spans for each service. Uh, usually, you can just collapse those and like look some particular service, so it's uh, easier to understand. But I hardly used anything else. Or, or, or maybe to query over all certain types of traces to find out uh, averages or error rates, or, or is it already provided? Um, I'm not sure about that. Like with general error rates, we still use metrics. So this is like for specific requests. Uh, usually, the interfaces provide you a, a way to find like interesting traces. Like I want to find traces that contain some certain tag, or or they're like like a trace that overlapped a few services. So you can find the particular trace, but after that, I don't think there's any aggregation. Would you have you, or would it be useful to build like some tooling on top of this open tracing, recorded traces? Uh, there's actually uh, communities building some tools over the, those. So, like I showed you the service dependency graph, what the there's uh, some tools on top of that, so you can uh, like find out which services are hit the most and what what are the some like critical flows and so on. But I haven't really looked much into those. Can you force a trace if it's uh, using uh, some limiter for this problematic plan? I want to trace. Uh, yeah, it. Um, I talked a little bit about the flags, so flags are in indicating if a trace should be saved or not. Uh, but uh, some clients also support like adding an HTTP header. So if you make a request, you manually add a header like this is a debug request, and then it forces it uh, to trace it throughout the system. Yeah. Uh, it, it works for both. Uh, at Clio, yeah, most of our requests are HTTP level, but we actually do some RPC calls over the RabbitMQ as well. Uh, so you can use uh, those as well. You just have to propagate the information somehow. Uh, some common libraries, I know like background jobs in Ruby, like Sidekick library, uh, has plugins to immediately enable tracing. If you're using some custom things, you might have to build it yourself, uh, but you can use it. And also, asynchronous traces uh, can be displayed uh, in the time sequence diagram. Uh, how they usually look is that uh, the root span will end at some point, and then, then some asynchronous uh, span starts from the end of here, like, and it, it will be added basically later. Yes. In order for the spans to display correctly, all the machines need to have right uh, clock or like time must right? Now. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is a common problem actually. This is uh, called the clock skew, and uh, yes, to display if these services are all in different machines and to display the spans correctly, they should have like a synchronous clock. But that basically is 
never the case. Uh, so what interfaces usually do is they kind of try to fix it. So if they see that this child span is like before the before it can even start, then it just moves it around. So visually you can still kind of understand, but yes, you, you can't really rely on the start position because this might be a little bit out. Um, I know Amazon Web Services provide uh, X-ray tracing, which is also kind of similar, so you can uh, use the same X-ray trace ID in your own system also. Uh, I haven't used it myself, and uh, like non-Amazon tracing clients like Jaeger and Sipkin, I'm not sure if they like, can do this, uh, probably not, uh, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, do you use Kiali on top of your Jager? Uh, sorry? Kiali is visualization system to you know, check infrastructure itself and check traffic. Um, we don't. So, uh, yeah, we, use it, we are using Datadog for all the metrics and traffic things, and currently the tracing is like a separate thing. Right. <laughs> what's, what's the scale of data and the transfers that you you're seeing with the one percent of production time? Um, I do not really know. <laughs> I initially we had more, and it started generating like terabytes of data uh, like within one day. So we scale it down, and I don't know they maybe you know, but I, I really have no idea at the moment. It hasn't been a problem anymore. So I check. <laughs> Right, thank you everybody. And if you have questions, you can later come and talk with me directly as well. <laughs>